screen now. Yep, good. So on the top here, you can see uh, the, or in this figure, you can see the efficiencies of different solar energy, uh, solar cell uh, technologies and how they have changed during the past 20 years. And on the top, you can see the traditional silicon solar cells and how their efficiency has stagnated around 25%. So uh, then on the red, we have the perovskite solar cells and their efficiency. And you can see that that has in improved significantly during the past 10 years. And based on this, we can be pretty sure that uh, perovskites have potential uh, to overtake silicon. And this is why we are interested in them and why I'm talking about them today. So what are perovskites? So basically any uh, atomic structure uh, or material that has this ABX3 atomic structure that you can see on the right is a perovskite. Uh, but the most efficient perovskites that you see, saw on the previous slide are actually much more complicated and they look uh, more like what we have here. Uh, they have uh, ionic mixing in multiple sites and also uh, these organic molecules such as form aminium and methyl ammonium in them. And even though their efficiencies are very high, uh, they haven't been uh, commercialized yet uh, because of some problems with instability and toxicity. And uh, we know that compositional engineering can help with these problems, but just due to the complexity of this material space, uh, using uh, traditional computational methods such as DFT is not feasible. And this is why our uh, objective is to use machine learning to accelerate the computations and through that use it uh, to optimize perovskite properties using compositional engineering. And in this presentation, I'm going to show you the first couple of steps towards this goal. So uh, I'm in, uh, presenting you our development of a machine learning framework that learns from density functional theory calculations uh, to predict perovskite properties quickly. And uh, then applying that, uh, that framework uh, for finding uh, stable alloying fractions for this uh, inorganic perovskite material that you can see here. And why we are using this material is that since it's inorganic and has only uh, at, uh, ionic mixing in one of the three sites, it's simple enough for a first test case. And although this material is not very interesting from the, on its own, from the solar cell perspective, it's also used in blue LEDs. And here is a small figure about the, uh, the approach that we are going to take, our machine learning approach. So we'll start with data generation. And then we will do, we will have a data set of atomic structures for which we do DFT uh, calculations to find the DFT energies. And then we will fit a machine learning model uh, that can map the atomic structures to energy. And then we will differentiate this machine learning model uh, so that we can use it for structure optimization. And finally, we will combine those uh, uh, optimization, uh, structure optimizations with Monte Carlo sampling to find the convex hull for this perovskite material. So first about the data, uh, we generate this data set of about 18,000 atomic structures that look a bit like this, or this, this is one, one example uh, from the data set. And uh, we included both single uh, point structures that were generated algorithmically and also structure relaxations from or structure snapshots from DFT relaxations. And in order to increase the diversity of the data, we included four different uh, lattice types or phases that the uh, perovskite material can take, those being PM3M, P4MBM, I4MCM, and PNMA. And then for all 18,000 atomic structures, we calculate the DFT total energies using FHI aims with PB functionals. And then the next step of our approach would be uh, to use machine learning to replace the DFT calculations so that we can quickly predict the total energy from the atomic structure. And our 
machine learning model has kind of two parts. Uh, first, we will use uh, many body tensor representation, MBTR, uh, for representing the atomic structures in vector form. And it, many body, MBTR is this um, a global uh, descriptor that in general uh, considers the elemental contents, the interatomic distances, and the uh, bonding angles in a structure to form the vectors. But we are actually only using the second order term, the K2 term. So we compute these distributions of interatomic distances according to this formula for each pair of elements in the data. And we then concatenate all the contributions from different element pairs to form these full vectors that you can see on the bottom. And then the second part of our machine learning model is uh, to map the energies or, or the uh, MBTR vectors to energy values using kernel rich regression. And the kernel function that we are using is Gaussian kernel, where the distance between two structures is defined as the Euclidean distance between the MBTR vectors that we just calculated. And both MBTR and KRR have hyperparameters that we optimize with Bayesian optimization. Okay, so now we have our model that can uh, map atomic structure to energy, but in order to use that model for structure optimization, we need to differentiate it. And uh, because our energy predictions are a composite function of KRR and MBTR, we need to differentiate both of those components separately. And this is exactly what we have done. So we derived and implemented uh, the uh, derivatives of the uh, model with regard to atomic positions and strain components. And this will give our uh, model an ability to predict atomic forces and uh, stress components according to this formula. And we can then combine these quick uh, derivative predictions uh, to, with BFGS algorithm to optimize our atomic positions and lattice parameters in the structures. Okay, so before we are ready to compute the convex hull, we still need to solve one problem which is finding optimal chlorine bromine configurations at each concentration level. And for that, we use Monte Carlo simulated annealing. And we in initialize this sampling algorithm with a PNMA structure that has a random chlorine bromine configuration. And we use PNMA here because during our data generation, we found that this is the most stable out of the four phases for this material. And then our algorithm um, samples more structures by swapping random pairs of chlorine and bromine atoms. And because of the exact uh, equilibrium atomic positions depend on the, on the configuration, we use the machine learning model to relax all the sample structures from which we obtain then the uh, change, changes in total energy uh, due to the swap that we made. And then this change in total energy affects the probability for us accepting this change in structure. And according to this formula that you can see, and in the formula T is the simulated temperature that we decrease linearly on each step towards zero Kelvin. Okay, so now we have all the building blocks for computing the convex hull. And we do that by uh, sampling 1000 different uh, configurations of chlorine bromine, uh, chlor chlorine and bromine atoms uh, per concentration level. And from that, we obtain a set of minimum energy structures that we can use to draw the convex hull. But at this point, I think it's a good idea to look at convex hulls in general. So they are a common tool in alloying physics. And I've pulled one example here on the right by Code Knight All, where they uh, computed the convex hull for a alloy of aluminum and niobium. And in the figure, all the black circles uh, are formation energies of different configurations of atoms. And then uh, the red line is the convex hull that goes below all the energies. And 
a material is stable uh, if, or a structure is stable if it's on the convex hull. So for this example, uh, the stable structures would be here and then here, but everything else is unstable. So for example, if you try to synthesize a material, material that had a concentration between these two points, it would phase, sep phase separate into the stable phases on the convex hull on both sides of that concentration that we are trying to synthesize. All right, but that's enough for the theory. So let's look at our results. On the left, you can see the energy learning curves for our model uh, for the four different phases. And for all, the, all of the phases, we reach uh, energy prediction errors of less than one milliliter volt per formula unit, so per five atoms. And then on the right, you can see a scatter plot comparing the DFT energies uh, to the machine learning predictions. And you can see that they fit quite nicely on the diagonal. And our MAE is only 0.69 electron volts per formal unit for the fully trained model. And the best thing about all of this is that the predictions are over four, four orders of magnitude faster than DFT. And here on the left, you can see the force prediction uh, learning curves. And this time we reach for all the phases, uh, force component prediction errors of less than 20 MeV per angstrom. And on the right, you can see some of the results for the relaxations or, or relaxation tests. So on the x-axis, we have the uh, DFT optimized energies. And on the y-axis, we have the machine learning relaxed energies. And I've only included the PNMA structures here because that's what we are mainly interested in, because that's what we are going to use in the convex hull computations. Okay, and for the relaxations, our uh, error is only 1.32 MeV per formal unit. Then here you can see our Monte Carlo sampling results. So each blue dot here corresponds to a different configuration that we relaxed with the machine learning model and then predicted uh, the uh, enthalpy of mixing. And here I've drawn a blue line that connects the minimum energy structures or minimum energy configurations. And on this line, the blue line, oh, this slide, the blue, blue line is still the same. So those are the results from the machine learning optimizations, but I've taken all the configurations on that line and also relaxed them with DFT. And although you can see, then that's the orange line. So although you can see that the machine learning model is systematically underestimating the energies for these minimum energy structures, the shape of these two lines are still the same. And then I've used the DFT relaxation results to draw the convex hull. And you can see that we have stable concentrations uh, or stable structures at two different uh, concentration levels. So here at one sixth chlorine concentration, and then another one at one third. And we can actually look at what these structures look like. And they look like this. And we can see that there is this uh, layered, uh, layered ordering of chlorine and bromine atoms. So at one sixth chlorine concentration, we have the one layer uh, here. And then at one third, we have this double layer structure here and here. And in our approach, we made no assumptions about the regularity of the structure. So all this order rises out of the randomness of the Monte Carlo. Yep, then let's conclude. So our research object objective was to uh, develop a machine learning framework for quick and accurate uh, pre uh, property predictions for perovskite materials. And we managed to do that, at least for this data set, we uh, achieved very high accuracies and also the predictions were really quick. We managed to do structural optimization using the model and then applied all of the tools that we de developed in finding these two stable alloying fractions for this inorganic perovskite material. And a little bit about the future. 
So the next step of our research that we are already working on is to synthesize uh, this uh, perovskite alloy and uh, confirm our results that way. And then after that, we will try to extend the machine learning framework for more complex perovskite materials. So we will include uh, ionic mixing in multiple sites and also these organic comp components. And that will allow us to then look for better solar cell materials. Thank you for your attention. If we have time for questions, I'll take them. Thank you, Jarno, and uh, for also for being on time. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so how about it? Oh, Patrick. There's a question on Zoom, yeah. Uh, so the question is if you've already also considered other perovskite structures, other ABX structures, and how does the band gap evolve uh, over the material space? So we haven't tested yet. So uh, maybe the question was asked before the my outlook section here, but uh, that is the next step. next thing that we are going to do is to uh, test this framework on different perovskite materials. And then about the band gaps, we actually also worked we ha haven't looked at, looked at them extensively yet, but we are also working on a, or working on uh, using the same prediction framework for predicting uh, band gaps. And until now, it seems to be working great, but I, I don't have any uh, figures here for the band gap. And I don't remember from the top of my head how it evolves over the concentration range. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Jarno? If not, maybe I have one. Uh, so uh, it was quite interesting to see this work after Zach's talk because uh, he was specifically asking how to uh, to do more work with forces and how we can get uh, accurate forces from these machine learning models. So I understood that here you trained on energies only, but your forces force accuracy seemed to be reasonable, very like in the milli EV per angstrom range. And certainly the results from machine learned optimizations produce very similar results from DFT optimizations. So what do you think, uh, why, why do you think your forces here were so good um, since you didn't train on forces and that's something that the people tend to do, train on both energies and forces? Yeah, so there's a huge difference of course between the data sets. So what Zach was uh, introducing were like huge data sets of, with a lot of vari vari chemical variety, whereas our data set is very specific and that probably helps. And also, I think we would benefit from uh, training with both energies and forces. So we might get even better results that way. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Any further questions? Well, if not, let's thank Jarno again. Thank you very much. Okay, let's welcome our next speaker. It's uh, Jonathan Schmidt from the group of Miguel Marquez at Halle, and uh, he'll be telling us about uh, machine learning for thermodynamically stable materials. Go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> 